Um, so first, I'd like to I'd actually like to thank the organizers for all their work putting together this conference, which looks like it's going to be um, a really great place for people from different areas to come together and talk about their work. And I think it, it really does uh, fill fill a need <clears throat> in the field. Uh, one of the one of the appealing things about cognitive neuroscience as a research area is that it's just full of fundamental but basically unsolved problems. And one of these problems in human vision is lightness perception. So I'm going to talk about some specific experiments on lightness perception, but I hope it'll also be clear that the methods that I'm using are very general, and I think we could use them to understand uh, many the behavior of, of many different uh, biological and computational systems. So lightness perception is the problem of how we see surface colors that are shades of gray from black through to white. And it's a surprisingly difficult problem, partly because we see surfaces under such a wide range of lighting conditions that the relationship between the grayness of a surface and the amount, th the amount of light that it sends to our eyes is actually very weak. Uh, nevertheless, our visual systems do overcome this problem, and generally speaking, we're quite good at perceiving uh, surface gray levels correctly. Now, there are dozens of illustrations about why this problem is not entirely straightforward. So a classic is simultaneous contrast, where we put identical gray patches uh, into black and white squares, and the patch in the black square then looks a little bit lighter than the other one. But this is, uh, this is a fairly subtle effect, though. Uh, the haze illusion, this haze illusion, is much stronger. So here, the two sets of disks are identical, but when we, uh, sorry, you can't see the citations there. This is, this is not my work. Um, so some work I'm setting, I guess you just won't know. So the, uh, the two sets of, um, the two sets of uh, disks are identical here, but when we add the right contest, uh, context, uh, the disks on the left look much, much darker. So here are the disks in isolation. Uh, here are the disks in context. And the effect is so strong here that it's just, I mean, it's just hard to believe it's an illusion, actually. The experiments that I'm going to talk about today will use the Argyle illusion. So here, all the diamonds are physically identical, but in context, the columns of diamonds look very light and very dark. So again, here are, here are the diamonds alone. Here they are in context. Some look very light, some look very dark. So here again, we see how weak the relationship between luminance and perceived gray actually is. And interestingly, if we break the surface up like this, so here's the original surface, here it is broken up, uh, then we lose the sense of sort of vertical lighting regions, like vertical strips of light and shade, and the illusion becomes much weaker. And this suggests that lightness percepts may depend on our visual system estimating the lighting conditions in a scene. I'll have more to say about that later. So I'm gonna talk about some experiments where we probe the mechanisms of lightness perception using two tools that aren't usually used together, namely perceptual matches and reverse correlation. So first, uh, perceptual matches. Suppose that we show the Argyle illusion to an observer and we ask them to judge which test patch looks lighter, A or B. We can do this many times and if we want to measure the strength of the illusion, then every time the observer says that A looks lighter, we can turn the luminance of A down and turn the luminance of B up a bit. <clears throat> and soon we converge to a point where the two test patches look approximately the same and I'm gonna call this the point of subjective quality or PSE. So the stronger the illusion, the farther the PSC is from matching the true luminances. And we can test computational models of lightness perception by comparing human observers' PSCs to the PSCs that the models predict. Uh, but PSCs, uh, useful as they are, don't directly address the question of what the key image features are in the computations that underlie lightness perception. And to get at that question, we can use a psychophysical version of reverse correlation methods. So suppose now that we continue the PSE experiment, but now on every trial, we randomly tweak the luminance of every image patch slightly up or down. So the observer still judges which patch is brighter, A or B. And some random tweaks are going to affect the observer's responses and others won't. So the question then is which image components drive the observer's lightness judgments and how do they contribute to perceived lightness? So one simple approach to this question is just to measure the correlation between the random tweaks in the image patches and the observer's responses. At different locations, we'll find positive, negative, or zero correlations, and the pattern of correlations across the, show, the whole stimulus will show us a lot about what image features uh, contribute to the observer's lightness judgments. 
So that's what we did uh, in these th with these three stimuli. In the standard and broken Argyle stimuli, we measured PSEs to gauge the strength of the illusion. And in what we call the noisy Argyle, we added Gaussian noise to the luminance value of every image patch on every trial. And we ran four human observers in 10,000 trials each. And from this data, we measured the correlation between the luminance fluctuations at each image patch and the observer's responses. Okay, so here are the results. First, the PSEs. Uh, this plot shows how much the contrast of test diamond A, the one on the left, had to be increased following, uh, increased in each condition in order for the two test diamonds to look the same. And as expected, there was a strong illusion in the standard and noisy argyles and a much weaker illusion in the broken argyle. So here are the correlation maps, which we sometimes call the classification images. The first four classification images are from individual observers, and the fifth is the average across all observers. Each image patch here shows the correlation between the luminance fluctuations at that location in the stimulus and the observer choosing test diamond A as appearing brighter. Positive correlations are white and negative correlations are black. The top row shows the raw correlations, and the bottom row shows a threshold inversion that indicates which correlations are statistically significant. So these images reveal several interesting facts about how people perceive lightness. So first, the effects are highly local. Only image regions that are very close to the test diamonds have any influence on observers' responses. And as we'll see later, this actually poses a problem for some computational models. Second, the effects are contrast-like. So these images show, so if you decode the, the, the black and white patches, what you, what you uh, understand is these images show that when bright images image patches appear near test diamond A, the observers are less likely to choose A. And when bright patches appear near diamond B, uh, the observer is less likely to choose B. So at least the direction of the effect is the same as in classic simultaneous contrast. And third, and maybe most interestingly, uh, the, the effects here are anisotropic. So the diamonds above and below the test diamonds affect lightness judgments, but the diamonds to the left and the right do not, even though they're the same distance away. Now, remember that the Argyle illusion is made up of vertical strips that give the impression of light and dark lighting regions. And in the, in the lightness literature, regions of uniform lighting are called lighting frameworks. So these classification images suggest that the elements in the same vertical lighting framework as the test patches have more of an effect than elements in other frameworks. So we ran a control experiment where we rotated all stimuli 90 degrees clockwise, and we ran another 10,000 trials for two observers. And then we found that the diamonds to the left and the right had an effect, but the diamonds above and below did not. So the effect does seem to track lighting frameworks, and we're not just seeing a bias towards the vertical. OK, so that's, that's all useful information about lightness perception. But does it help us evaluate computational models of lightness perception? Well, to check this out, we implemented three current models of, uh, of uh, lightness perception and ran them through exactly the same experiments that human observers ran in. So I'll tell you briefly about the models that we looked at, three of them anyway. Uh, lateral inhibition is a classic model that uses a linear filter with an excitatory center and an inhibitory surround. In the simplest version, uh, we just involve the stimulus image with this filter, and the output is the lightness percept. And uh, in fact, this, this model accounts for many classic lightness effects like simultaneous contrast. The ODOG model is a more elaborate uh, lateral inhibition model that convolves the stimulus with a bank of oriented filters at several scales, and then it combines the filter responses in a way that involves applying gain control at each orientation. So this is a very successful low-level model that accounts for lightness percepts in many different figures, including some illusions that at first uh, would seem to depend on higher level factors like lighting frameworks. And third, the anchoring model is a mid-level model that takes a very different approach. This model first divides the stimulus up into lighting frameworks, which is to say regions of uniform lighting. And within each framework, the model assigns a white percept to the patch with the highest luminance and assigns lightnesses to other patches based on the ratio of their luminance to the highest luminance. And the model also includes mechanisms that allow reflectance estimates to leak between, between different uh, lighting frameworks. So just like with human observers, we ran these three models in an experiment where we measured PSCs and uh, reverse correlation maps in three conditions. So here are the model's PSCs along with the average human PSCs for comparison. 
Our main goal was to find the classification image for the models, but the PSEs actually turned out to be very informative as well because we ran, we ran the models in all conditions of a real experiment and we measured their performance using the same metric we used for human observers, namely PSEs. So human observers uh, see a strong illusion in the standard and noisy conditions and a weaker illusion in the broken condition. The lateral inhibition model actually has this backwards. So it sees a stronger illusion in the broken condition than in the standard and noisy conditions. And the ODOG model uh, perceives a very weak illusion in the wrong direction. So the test diamond that looks brighter to humans actually looks darker to the ODOG. So we were surprised to find that when you put humans and models through the same experiment, it becomes very clear that these low-level models are inadequate. Uh, the anchoring model, though, perceives approximately the same pattern of, of, of illusions as human observers do. So here are the model's classification images along with uh, the average from humans. Uh, the lateral inhibition model, being a simple linear filter, is not good at detecting lighting framework boundaries. So local elements around the test patches affect this model's responses, uh, but they're both too local and not local enough. The effects don't extend very far within the vertical lighting frameworks, but they do extend horizontally into neighboring frameworks, and that just doesn't happen for human observers. The ODOG uh, uses highly local image elements, and the sign of the correlation for these elements is in the wrong direction. So when test diamond A is surrounded by bright elements, the ODOG is more likely to choose that diamond. That's the opposite effect we found for human observers, so the ODOG actually has an inappropriate kind of contrast assimilation. So you can see that the low-level models failed the PSE test because they compute lightness in qualitatively different ways than human observers do. And the anchoring model, which did have reasonable PSEs, also shows a very different classification image from human observers. In this model, all elements in a lighting framework contribute to lightness, and the distance between two elements is unimportant. So as a result, uh, the classification image shows effects that were not local at all, and they extend all the way up and down through the vertical lighting frameworks. So this is obviously a part of the anchoring model that needs to be revised in order to match human behavior. Okay, so, so what do we learn from all this? Well, the main thing specifically about lightness perception is the very direct evidence that the computation behind lightness perception does track something like lighting frameworks. So low-level models don't do that very well, and as a result, their lightness percepts uh, are often qualitatively different from those of human observers. Mid-level models uh, do take lighting frameworks into account, but a point that I've glossed over is that these models are actually much less computational than we would like. And for instance, they need to be told where lighting boundaries in the stimuli are in order to produce lightness estimates. And uh, I think this might be historically because most psychologists working in mid-level vision light grouping, uh, just a lot of them haven't been very computationally inclined, although that's certainly changing you know, to some extent now. Uh, so I think a promising direction for work on lightness perception and one that we're pursuing is to use existing modeling tools, uh, like say Markov random fields, to develop a genuinely computational mid-level model that incorporates some of the insights about grouping and frameworks that have come out of experiments like the ones I've talked about today. And I think this is just one example of how there is a need for more talk between related fields, and in particular how it could be very productive for perceptual psychology to incorporate tools that have been developed in uh, computer vision and AI. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, if, it is, if it is true that uh, the lighting boundaries uh, play an important role in the, um, uh, in the illusions, I mean, one of the things that, that effects like the haze illusion, the argyle illusion rely on is that you can create a sense of these lighting boundaries in very flexible ways, right? So the low level image features could actually have very, have, have very little to do with whether there seems to be a lighting boundary. So I would expect that no, retinal, retinal models are not going to be able to account for, at least for, you know, things like the, the argyle illusion that seem to rely on lighting boundaries, yeah. Great, let's thank the speaker once more.